Hi folks, um, and welcome to another forecasting session. Um, so uh, today uh, we are looking at autoregressive models. Um, and the reason we're doing this um, is because they are very the, the data format required for these models and the way that you have to forecast with them uh, is very similar to how you would use a feed-forward neural network. Um, so th these are much simpler. Um, so we're going to focus on using these simpler models to start off with and, and think about the data pro uh, processing requirements and the forecasting approach um, before we get bogged down in any detail about neural networks. Um, so uh, there's so, so what we're going to look at are the mechanics of fitting time series data to to an autoregressive model, um, and then we're going to look at two approaches to two quite different approaches to forecasting multiple steps into the future. Um, so the first of those is what we call the iterative approach to forecasting, um, and the second is the direct approach. Um, so the iterative approach. Um, is where you're uh, forecasting step by step and you're taking the values that you're predicting and you're winding them back and plugging them into your forecasting model in order to make that next step. So eventually you start forecasting off your forecasts. Um, and with a direct modeling approach, we build multiple regression models. So if we were working with monthly data and we were predicting 12 months ahead, we would build 12 models and each of those models would predict a specific time period into the future. So let's bring our imports in. So we've got NumPy pandas and matplotlib as usual, uh, but we're also going to work with stats models today um, because stats models um, contains the ordinary least squares regression that we're going to use to build our autoregressive model. Uh, so from stats models, uh, I'm using version 0.1. 1.1, um, you need to use at least that version. Uh, so uh, we're then going to bring in from regression.linear model the ordinary least square OLS class. So let's generate some data first. Um, so we're going to work with um, some really simple synthetic data. Um, before we get into any real healthcare data. Uh, and that's just because I want to avoid any confusion about the method. So we're going to work with a cosine wave. Um, what do I mean by that? Um, so it's just a, a, a wave that um, iterates between one and minus one in a completely predictable pattern. We haven't got any noise in the data. Um, and in NumPy terms, that's just a vector. Um, so it's a, a single column in a spreadsheet of data points. Okay, so that's our time series that we're trying, we're going to try and predict with our autoregressive model. So to do this, we need to um, change the format of our data. So if you've ever worked with regression before, you'll know that you have a y variable that you're trying to predict. Uh, sometimes that's called a target variable and sometimes it's called a dependent variable. And then you've got a set of variables that you're you're fitting on. So they are they are your independent predictor variables or features in machine learning terms. Um, so you can think of that um, as a table of data or a spreadsheet of data. So you have columns and each of those columns represent um, independent variables. And then you have a final column, which is your Y variable that you're trying to predict. So in an autoregressive model, those independent variables are lagged variables. Um, so I'll show, it's probably easier to show you that um, with some data than to try and explain it in words. So I'll, I'll create this function called sliding window, and I'll come, I'll come back to that in a moment to explain how it works. Um, but let's, let's, let's use that function and see what it creates. Um, so we're going to do a, a quick train test split first. So we're going to hold back um, uh, the final few points in the series. We're going we're to train on 175 points. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to create um, 
uh, X training data and Y training data by using this function sliding window. And we're passing in the training data and we're saying we want um, a window size of two, which means we're going to build an autoregressive model of lag two. Um, so what do we get from that function? We get um, two NumPy arrays and uh, the first of those, the X train, um, has 172 rows and two columns. And the Y train has 172 rows and one column. Did I say 172 rows there or columns? I should have said rows um, and, and two columns. So let's take a look at these. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to print out our original unpreprocessed data. And we're going to print out the first three data points there. And then we're going to print out the first array within our subarray within our X train and the first array within our Y train. So these are the first three points in our time series uh, 1, 0 0.98, and 0 0.92. In our pre processed data, what we end up with is a X train of 1 and 0 0.98, so the first two values in this window. And then our Y train is 0 0.92. Okay, so the final value in the sequence. Let's look at the let's slide our window along um, and look at the next three data points. So now the first value in our time series is 0 0.98, then 0 0.92 and then 0 0.82. So we've start, so we've slid our window across one and we're starting from this value now, a second value in our sequence. So in our pre-processed data, our training values are 0 0.98, 0 0.92. There are x, x are independent variables and then our y variable is 0 0.82. So we've slid that window across and then these two values become our independent variables and the final value in the sequence becomes our dependent variable. So let's just have a look at that as a pandas data frame. Okay, because this is, this is equivalent to a sort of spreadsheet notation. Um, so this is what you end up with. So we've gone from a single column of data to three columns of data in a, in a lag two model. So we've got, our, we've got our first column, which is the, the, the previous two lags, uh, lag two, and then we've got our second column, which is lag one, and then we've got our Y variable here. Okay, so we've, we've changed our single column, we've transformed it into multiple columns of data. So that looks identical now to a sort of standard data set that you would train a regression model on. So we've done that with this function called sliding window that I've provided for you. Um, so that takes three parameters, the training data, which is a, um, a, a NumPy array, so a, a NumPy vector, so a single column of data, the window size, so the number of lags that you want to include in your model, um, and then the horizon. So let's ignore horizon for the time being. We'll come back to that when we look at the direct forecasting approach. So this is just a simple for loop. Um, so what's happening is we're building up our tabular X and Y data. Um, so on each iteration of the for loop, we look at our training data and we select our independent variables for that window. And then we select um, our Y variable that we're trying to predict in that window as well. And then we save both of those in our tabular X and Y arrays and then return them at the end of the um, function. Um, with a bit of NumPy magic there just to make sure that our single column of Y data is in the right shape. So this data is equivalent to the data you would feed into a, um, a neural network model for time series, at least a feed forward neural network, because effectively that's a, that's a form of regression model. So um, I'm not going to go over the theory of ordinary least squares regression today. 
Um, what I will do is show you how you build that model in stats models. Um, so we've got our X training data. Um, we need to make sure that stats models includes a constant term in our regression model. So we call um, stats models dot add constant to our X training data. Uh, and then our model is simply we call the ordinary least squares regression class and we pass in our Y training data as our endogenous variable and then our exogenous variable is our X train. Um, it's kind of economics language for regression. It's what is your Y and X values there. So we create our ordinary least squares regression model and then we call fit. Fit returns um, a regressions result object um, and we use that for prediction. Um, so we can see what that model looks like with a summary. So what we can see is the R squared, which is a uh, one way to measure the fit of the model, and that about varies between zero and one. It's a perfect fit. Okay, so because it's a simple cosine data, we our model fits exactly. Um, and then we can see the variables in our model and um, their coefficients. So the values that the ordinary least squares procedure has fitted to our data. So we can see that um, uh, these are the coefficients for our constant. Um, and then I'm now a bit confused this, if this is lag one or lag two. Um, I think this is lag one x two um, because that's got the bigger value. So it's putting a lot of weight on the um, previous value. Um, and quite yeah, quite a lot of weight on the uh, two legs as well. Okay, so that's so you're, you're then feeding that data into your model, and it, it, it basically weights the inputs by these coefficients, and out pops a forecast. Okay, so next we'll take a look at uh, forecasting one step ahead. Okay, welcome back. Um, so let's take a look at forecasting one step ahead. Um, so good news, this is very straightforward. Um, so the regression results object that we've got um, implements a predict method. Um, who would have thought it? And we just need to pass in um, our exogenous variables, which is our um, array of X data. Um, so for example, if we wanted to forecast just one step ahead into the future, um, we take our X test data um, and we add a constant to it again. And then we call model.predict and we pass in the first value from that array. Okay, and that returns our prediction. Now the eagle-eyed on you may see that there is um, some array notation on the end of predict there, and that's because it returns um, a NumPy array, uh, and I want to show you a scalar value here, a single a single value. So um, this is our one step forecast, which is uh, minus zero point six six five six, and this is our ground uh, truth, trust, ground truth value. Get it right. Uh, ground truth value is minus 0 0.6656. Okay, so absolutely uh, identical to a certain number of decimal places anyway. Uh, and that's not surprising because uh, we had a, a model that was, was almost a perfect fit. Um, a nice thing about the regression model is that we can um, get um, use this get prediction um, and that can that means we can get a easily get a um, prediction interval um, around our results, so we can get we can get our results in a nice um, pandas data frame. Um, so we go back to our model, which is a regression results object, call the get prediction um, method, uh, and pass in our x test data, the first value in it that returns a prediction results object, um, which we call results, and then we call the summary frame off that. And we've asked for an 80% um, prediction interval. Um, so here we go. We've got our, our mean value, which is our point forecast. 
um, and then we've got our standard error of that mean uh, and we then convert that into um, a confidence interval around that mean and then um, an observation confidence interval which is our prediction interval that's what we're interested in when we're forecasting um, and you can see that, that there, there's there's no uncertainty with this model um, but if you were doing that for real with a um, with a proper healthcare data set there would be a fair bit of uncertainty about the future Okay, so next up, we'll take a look at forecasting multiple periods into the future using the first of our methods, the iterative method. Welcome back. Okay, so let's talk about the iterative method for forecasting with a regression model. So in the previous um, example, we saw how to predict one step ahead. And we did that using the previous two observations in the time series. So how do we predict the next step ahead? Because we don't have the ground truth observations at that point because we're forecasting two steps ahead. So the answer is instead of using ground truth observations for our forecast, we're going to use one ground truth observation and our forecast for our one step ahead prediction. So let's have a look how that works. Um, so let's take, for example, a situation where we've predicted one step ahead and our forecast is 999. We're building a model uh, based on four lags. Okay, and our four lags are one, two, three, four. And we now want to create data that we put into our forecasting model to predict this second step ahead, another step ahead. So the way I've always done that is to use uh, np.roll. So let me show you how that works. So if we've got our current um, x variables, which is one, two, three, four, I'm gonna call np.roll and I'm gonna shift everything by minus one. And that's gonna work in a circle. So one is gonna to move to the end of the array here and four is gonna move down one three is going to do, move down one. So we end up with this, two, three, four, and one. We now want to drop this off the end because we want to replace that with uh, what we think is the latest value in our sequence, which is our forecast of 999. So I'm now going to add another line of code, which uses array slicing to add on our y prediction onto the end of that x vector. So this is the data we now put into our forecast and it will then predict the next value in the sequence. So we can do that uh, with a function, surprise, surprise. So I've created one called autoregressive iterative forecast where you pass in your model, which will be your OLS model your exogenous variables, which will be your X array um, and the number of steps ahead you want to forecast. And it's going to return a NumPy array of your predictions. So it just copies that code that we had up here and puts it into a loop. So we're continually going to loop through, create a Y prediction by calling model.predict, where we pass in our current X values and we save that prediction in an array. Then we roll our array and we add our new Y prediction onto the head of that array. And then at the end, we return all of our Y predictions. So if we forecast far enough ahead, we're only going to be using forecast variables. So we're going to be forecasting off forecasts. And that is essentially how um, an iterative forecast works. Um, so let's try that. So let's try um, forecasting uh, five time periods into the future. We're going to use our model. So let's just remind ourselves what our model was. Scroll up. Um, so this was our model and we fitted it on two lags. OK, so if we're forecasting five into the future, we're going to end up predicting 
off predictions. Where are we? Here we go. So we just call our auto regressive iterative forecast method, pass in our OLS model, pass in our first um, test data array and H, which is set to five, which is our forecast horizon. So this is what we end up with. So our iterative forecast gives us these values. So in summary, that's uh, 0 0.66, minus 0 0.66, minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.32. And we can compare that to our ground truth values, which are minus 0 0.665, minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.32. Just to highlight that there for you. Um, so you can see that um, they're pretty much identical. Uh, in fact, when yes, they're completely identical um, because we're forecasting this simple cosine wave. And each time we produce a forecast, it's pretty much identical to the ground truth value. So when we feed that back in, um, it's like feeding a ground truth value back in. So let's, let's see what happens when our time series isn't so well behaved. Let's add in some noise. So again, we're going to create a cosine wave of, of size 200, but now we're going to create some, some noise, some, some jitter to add into that, which will be normally distributed with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of 0 0.3. And now if we plot that, don't worry if you don't fully understand that, if we plot that, that just means we've got a noisy cosine wave. Okay, so it's not smooth. Um, there's, some, there's some randomness added to that data. Okay, so this uh, select model via AIC function um, is just to help me to decide how many um, lags I should include in my model. Um, so it's gonna try um, a range of uh, window sizes. Um, so I'm going to try um, up to, to from two to 20 in, in stepping up in two each time. Uh, and I'm just going to select the one that fits my data the best. And I'm going to use something called um, AIC to do that selection, a cakey information criterion. Um, and that just means that it's going to try and pick the simplest model that's the best fit to the data. So if we run that, um, it's decided that we need to include a model with 18 lags, so quite a lot of data included. Um, so if we plot that, uh, what we've done is we've fitted an ordinary least squares regression of, with uh, an autoregressive terms of order 18, so 18 lags are included in the model. Um, and when we plot that, the blue line represents our actual data, our noisy, our noisy cosine wave, and our fitted model, our regression model, is the orange data. So we can see it's a pretty good fit to the data that it's seen. So now what we want to do is set up our test data and pass in um, the test data to our model to see how well it does at forecasting data it hasn't seen. So how well can it forecast uh, this remaining blue data into the future. Okay, so we're going to select our best window size, which is of size 18. And we're going to call our sliding window method to get our training data and our test data. Then we're going to build our model, uh, our regression model. Uh, and then we're going to pass that regression model to our autoregressive iterative forecast method to produce our iterative predictions. And we're gonna go the full length of the test data into the future. And then we'll plot that at the end. So we've just plotted the test data. So what can we see? Well, the blue line is our iterative forecast. And then our orange line is our ground truth value this time. Um, so you can see that that's, that's a reasonable fit. It's still been able to pick up the pattern in the data, even though there's some noise added to it, which is good. Um, so next up, we will take a look at the direct forecasting method. Uh, so welcome back. And now we're gonna talk about the direct forecasting method. 
So this is different from the iterative approach because in this method um, for forecasting multiple periods ahead, we're going to create multiple models. Uh, so in this example, the, it's telling me here, the length of the Y test data is 31 periods. So to use the direct forecasting method, that means we need to build 31 models. So the first of those models will be a one-step forecaster. It will be trained on values that predict one step ahead. The second of those models will be a two-step forecaster. So it will predict not the first time period ahead, but the second. So it will only predict a single value, but that will be the second in the sequence ahead. And the third will predict the third value ahead, and so on. So let's think back to our sliding window uh, function. Um, so that contained a third parameter which we ignored at that point, which is the horizon. Okay, and by default that's set to one. So by default the sliding window function will produce a one-step forecaster for you. Now what we're going to do is use that to predict different horizons into the future. So for example, if we wanted to build a model that predicted two steps ahead, we would set horizon to two. Okay, so I'm going to pass in my training data, which remember is the raw format of the time series. I'm going to build a lag two model, so I want my window size to be of size two. And I'm going to forecast two time steps into the future, and that's going to return a vector of X training data and a vector of Y training data. Let's take a look at those. Okay, so this first output is our raw time series data. Okay, and that's going to, and that's shown us the first five values in that sequence. Our second output is our X vector of training data. So we can see that's a two lag model. So it shows the first two values in the sequence. And then our Y train, um, our third value output is our, is our Y train, our scalar value that we're trying to predict. Um, and that is 0 0.31. So let's have a look at our raw data. So one, two, three, four. Okay, so that's the fourth value in our sequence. So we're training on these two values and then we're predicting this value. So we're constructing a table of data that consists of three columns. The first two columns are lags one and two and then we're predicting um, two time points into the future. That's our third column. So let's try that now um, with the same training data, the same window size, but predicting uh, three points into the future. So if this is our training data, then three points into the future is 0 0.92. So let's just check that's worked. So here's our training data, our first two points in the sequence, that's correct, and then our Y target variable is 0 0.92, which is the final point in our in our five sequence. So that, that works as well. So this would be the data that we would train our third regression model on. Um, so we need an approach to train these models. Um, so the simplest way to do this is just in a loop. Um, so that's the code that follows next. Um, so we've created um, a Python list called models. And that's going to contain each of the 31 models we're going to train. We're going to save it in there. We've created um, a variable called horizon and assigned the value of 31 to that so that we know we're going to loop 31 times. And then here's our for loop. So 4h in range horizon, so up to the value 31. Create my sliding window of training data. So pass in my raw training data, pass in my window size, which we know our best, well, we think our best is 18. Um, and then we're going to call, um, uh, we're going to pass in the horizon. So this will start from zero. So we're just going to pass in plus one there to make sure we're not doing anything um, silly with our prediction. Then we create our model. So in stats models, remember, we need to add this constant to our training data. And then we call it, we're calling our model, model H. So we call our OLS class, pass in 
our Y train, pass in our X train and then call fit and then append that, that results to our models list. Okay, so as quick as that, we've got 31 models that we can use to predict into the future. So to predict with these models, you again would use a loop. Uh, so we've created a, um, another function, this time it's called direct forecast. That takes the Python list of models and it takes our initial training data. Te sorry, test data that we're going to use to predict. So it's just a really simple loop where we're looping through the models that we've created. And then on each of those models in that array, we call predict. And then we save the scalar results in uh, a, va a value called predH. And then we store that in a Python list called preds. So we loop through all of those and create our 31 predictions from our 31 models and then we return that. And I'm just casting that to a NumPy array there um, because that's what I want to get out of the, the function. So let's try that. Okay, so just for clarity, uh, I'm recreating our sliding window of, of test data here. Um, so we've got X test and Y test. Uh, and then I'm just adding the constant value to my X test data. Uh, and then I'm passing the first vector from my X test data, that's all I need, into my direct forecasting function. And that forecasting function is gonna loop through all of the models I've created and build my predictions and return it in a NumPy array. So let's plot those and see what it looks like. So our direct forecasting method is shown in blue and our ground truth value is shown in orange. So again, you can see that it follows the pattern we would expect it to if it was working correctly. Um, so we, we have that um, uh, kind of like seasonal pattern you get in a cosine wave. And um, so they both looked uh, good matches to the data. Um, let's measure their performance We're using root mean squared error. Uh, what we'll first do is we'll, we'll plot all of them just to, to have a look. Um, so we can see uh, the blue is the direct forecasting method. Um, the orange is the iterative forecasting method. And then the ground truth is now shown in green. So it's actually quite difficult from just this simple chart to determine which is the best forecasting method. Um, you can see at the start, um, they're performing quite in a quite similar way. Um, and then when we're getting to sort of 10 predictions ahead, 15 predictions ahead, they start to diverge a little bit, but they're, they're surprisingly similar. So let's have a go at calculating the root mean square error, squared error. So from stats models, um, import root mean squared error, and then let's plot them. Uh, so output the results. So this is now for y pred preds iter. So this is the um, iterative uh, forecasting root mean square error. Um, and then this is the direct method. Oops. Uh, so the direct method has outperformed the, um, uh, the iterative method in this particular example. Um, so that doesn't mean uh, that that will always be the case. Um, you, you might find an iterative approach works better on the particular data set that you are working with. 